Good morning and welcome back to theCUBE where we are excited to be broadcasting live all week from Detroit, Michigan at KubeCon slash CloudNativeCon, depending on who you're asking. Lisa, it's day two, things are buzzing. They How are you feeling? Good, excited, ready for day two, ready to have more great conversations to see how this community is expanding, how it's evolving, and how it's really supporting it itself. Yeah, yeah, this is a very supportive community, something we talked a lot about. And speaking of community, we've got some very bold and brave folks over here. We've got the CTO and the head of product from Stormforge, and they are on a mission to automate Kubernetes. Now, automatic and Kubernetes are not words that go in the same sentence very often. So please welcome Patrick and Yasmin. Thank you both for being here. Hello, Hi. how are you Hello. doing today? Thanks for having Pretty us. Good. Thanks for having us. Talk about what you guys are doing, because as you said, Kubernetes yeah, auto scaling exactly. is anything but auto. Yeah. The, what are some of the challenges? How do you help? Yeah, those? so the mission at Stormforge is primarily automatic resource configuration and optimization, essentially. So we started as a machine learning company first, and it's kind of an interesting story, because we're one of those startups that has pivoted a few times. Mm. And so we were running our machine learning workloads. Most in, have, I think. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, were, we started out running our machine learning workloads and moving them into Kubernetes, and then we weren't quite sure how to correctly adjust and size our containers. And so our ML team, we've got three PhDs in applied mathematics. They said, well, hang on, we could write an algorithm for that. And so they did. Oh, and I then, love this. Yeah, and then we said, well, holy cow, that's actually really useful. I wonder if other people would like that. And that's kind of where we got our start. You solved your own problem, and then you built a business around it. Yeah, exactly. That is fantastic. Is, is that driving product development at Stormforge still, that kind of attitude? I mean, that kind of attitude definitely drives product development, but we're you know balancing that with what the users are, um, the challenges that they have, especially at large scale. We deal with a lot of large enterprises, and for us as a startup, we can relate to the problems that come with Kubernetes when you're trying to scale it, but when you're talking about the scale of some of these larger enterprises, it's just a different mentality, so we're trying to balance that of how we take that input into how we build our product. Talk about that, the, the, the end yeah. user input and how you're taking that in, because of course, it's only going to be a, you know, more of a symbiotic relationship when that customer feedback is taken in and acted on. Yeah, totally, and for us, because we use machine learning, it's a lot of uh, building confidence with our users, so making sure that they understand how we look at the data, how we come up with the recommendations and actually deploy those changes in their environment, there's a lot of trust that needs to be built there, so being able to go back to our users and say, okay, we're presenting you this type of data, give us your feedback, and building it alongside mm -hmm. them um, has helped a lot in these relationships. Absolutely, yeah. you said the word trust, and that's something that we talk about at every show. I it's, was going to jump on it's, that too, it's yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, it's not a buzzword, it's not, it shouldn't no. be. Yeah. It really should be, I want to say lived and breathed, but that's probably yeah. grammatically incorrect. <laughs> well, we're not a grammar really, show, it's okay, darling. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> it should be truly embodied. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's not even unique to just what we do, but across tech in general, right? Like when I talk about SRE and building SRE teams, one of the things I mention is you have to build that trust first. And with machine learning, I think it can be really difficult too for a couple different reasons. Like one, it tends to be a black box if it's actually true machine learning. Totally. Which ours is. But the other piece That's that we rad. run into, yeah. yeah, and the other piece we run into though is, is what, I was an executive at United Health Group before I joined Stormforge, and I would get companies that would come to me and try to sell me machine learning, and I would kind of look at it and say, well, no, that's just a basic decision tree, or like that's a super basic whole Twitter forecast, right? Like that's not actually machine learning. And that's one of the things that we actually find ourselves kind of battling a little bit when we talk about what we do in building that trust. Talk a little bit about the latest releases. You guys had a very active September. Here we are and towards the, I think, end of October. Yeah. What are some of the, the new things that have come out, new integrations, new partnerships? Give us a scoop on that. Yeah, um, well I guess I'll start and then I'll probably hand it over to you, but like the, the big thing for us is we talked about automating Kubernetes in the very beginning, right? Like Kubernetes has got a VPA. Just it's a wild got, sentence yep. anyway. Yeah, yeah. It, it has I'm a, not going to get over it the whole show. <laughs> yeah. It has a VPA built in, it has an HPA built in, and, and when you look at the data, and it, even when you read the documentation from Google, it explicitly says never the two should meet, right? Because you'll end up right. crashing and they'll fight each other. Um, well, the big release we just announced is with our machine learning, we can now do both. And so we can vertically scale your pods to the Best correct size. That. Yeah, yeah bar right? status, I love that. Yeah, we can, we can scale your pods to the correct size and still allow you to enable the HPA and we'll make recommendations for your scaling points and your thresholds on the HPA as well so that they can work together to really, truly maximize your efficiency but without sacrificing your uh, performance and your reliability of the applications that you're running. That sounds like a massive differentiator for I would say it is, yeah. I think, as far as I know, we're the first in the industry that can do this, yeah. 
And from it feels a very singularity vibes yeah, too. You right? know, the machines are learning, teaching themselves, right. and doing it all automatically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, and from a customer demand perspective, what's the feedback been? Yeah. It's been a few weeks. Yeah, it's been really great actually. Um, and a lot of why we went down this path was user driven because they're doing horizontal scale and they want to be able to vertically size um, as they're scaling. So mm -hmm. if you put yourself in the shoes of someone that's configuring Kubernetes, you're usually guessing on what you're setting your CPU requests and limits to, but horizontal scale makes sense. You're either adding more things or removing more things. And so once they actually are scaled out as a large environment and they have to rethink, how am I going to resize this now? It's just not possible. It's so many thousands of settings across all the different environments and you're only thinking about CPU memory. You're not thinking about a lot of things. It's just, but once you scale that out, it's a big challenge. So they came to us and said, okay, you're doing, because we were doing vertical scaling before and now we enable vertical and horizontal. And so they came to us and said, I love what you're doing about right sizing, but we want to be able to do this while also horizontally scaling. And so the way that our software works is we give you the recommendations for what the settings should be and then allow Kubernetes to continue to add and uh, remove replicas as needed. So it's not like we're going in and making changes to Kubernetes, but we make changes to the configuration settings so that it's the most optimal from a resource perspective. Efficiency has been a real big theme of the show. Yeah. And it's clear that that's a focus for you. Yep. Everyone here wants to do more faster, of course, and innovation, mm -hmm. that's the thing. To do that, sometimes we need partners. You just announced an integration with Datadog. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, the way our platform works is we need data, of course, right? <laughs> so they're, they're a great partner for us. Um, and we use them both as an input and an output. So we uh, pull in metrics from Datadog to provide recommendations. and we'll actually display all those within the Datadog portal, because we have a lot of users that are like, look, Datadog's my single pane of glass, and I hate using that word, but they get all their insights there, they can see their recommendations, and then actually go deploy those, whether they want to automatically have the recommendations deployed or go in and actually push a button. So give me an example of a customer that is using the, the new release and some of the business outcomes they're achieving. I imagine one of the things that you're enabling is just closing that Kubernetes skills gap, but from a business level perspective, how are they gaining like competitive advantages to be able to get products to market faster, for example? Yeah, so uh, one of the uh, customers that was actually part of our uh, press release and launch and spoke about us at a webinar, um, they are a SaaS product and deal with really bursty workloads. And so their cloud costs have been growing 40% year over year. And their platform engineering team wow. is basically enabled to provide the automation for developers in, in their environment, but also to reduce those costs. So they want to, it's that trade off of uh, resiliency and cost performance. And so they came to us and said, look, we know we're over provisioned, but we don't know how to tack that, tackle that problem without throwing tons of humans at the problem. And so we worked with them and just on a single app found 60% savings and we're working now to kind of deploy that across their entire production workload, but that allows them to then go back and get more out of the, the budget that they already have and they can kind of reallocate that in other areas. Right, so they're going to be top line and bottom line yeah. impact. And I, th I think there's some really direct impact to the carbon emissions of an organization as well. That's like a good point. when you can reduce your compute consumption by 60%. I love this, we haven't talked about this at all during yeah. the show yet, yeah. and I'm really glad that you aspect. brought this up. All of the things that power this use energy. Yep. What is it, like 7 to 8% of all electricity in the world is consumed by data centers? Like it's crazy. Yeah, yeah and so like for That's us. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. So being able to make a reduction in impact there too, especially with organizations oh, that are trying to sign green pledges and everything else, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, ESG initiatives are Absolutely. huge right yeah. now. Absolutely. It's a whole vibe. A lot of companies have ESG initiatives where they can't even go out and do an RFP with a business right. if they right. don't have yeah. an actual active, yeah, we're yeah. impactful to see that. ESG yeah. program. Yes. Yeah. In the Which RFPs exciting. that we have to fill out, we have to tell them how they'll help. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's so, yeah, I mean, I was really struck when I looked on your website and I saw 54% average cost reduction for, yeah. for your cloud operations. I hadn't even thought about it from a power perspective. Yeah. I mean, imagine if we cut that to 3% yep. of the world's power grid. That is just, that is very yeah. compelling. Speaking of compelling and exciting future things, Talk to us about what's next, what's got you pumped for 2023 and, and what lies ahead. Oh man, well that seems like a product conversation for sure. Well, <laughs> we're super excited about extending what we do to other platforms, other metrics. Um, so we optimize a lot right now around CPU and memory, but we can also give people insights into um, you know, limiting oom kills, limiting CPU throttling, so extending the metrics. Um, and when you look at HPA and horizontal scale, today most of it is done with CPU, but there are some yeah. organizations out there that are scaling on custom metrics, so being able to 
take in more data to provide more recommendations and kind of extend what we can do from an optimization standpoint. That's, yeah, that's cool. And what has you most excited on the show floor? Anything, anything that you've seen, any keynotes? There's, well, I haven't had a lot of time to go to the keynotes, unfortunately, but it's- Well, it's, I'm shocked, you've been busy or yeah, something? Yeah, right? You don't want your time I here? I can't imagine <laughs> why, but no, there's, it's really interesting to see all the vendors that are popping up around Kubernetes focus, specifically right. with um, security is always something that's really interesting to me, and automating CI, CD, and how they continue to dive into that automation. DevSecOps continues to be a big thing Huge. for a lot of organizations, yeah. yeah. I, I do, I think it's interesting, when we were, were you guys here last year? I was not no, here, no. no. So yeah. at, at the smaller version of this in Los Angeles, yeah. I, I was really struck because there was still a conversation of whether or not we were all in on Kubernetes mm -hmm. as, as kind of a community and a mm -hmm. society. This year, and I'm curious if you feel this way too, everyone feels committed. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I feel like there's no question that Kubernetes is the tool that we are going to be using. Yeah, I, I think so, and I think a lot of that is actually being unlocked by some of these vendors that are being partners and helping people get the most out of Kubernetes. You know, especially at the larger enterprise organizations, like they want to do it, but the skills gap is a very real problem. Right. And so figuring out, like Yasmin talked about, figuring out how do we, you know, optimize or set up the correct settings without throwing thousands of humans at it. Never mind the fact you'll never find a thousand people that want to do that all day, every day. I was right? just going to say, it's a bold yeah. <laughs> yeah. endeavor for those people. Yeah, right. and, and yeah. being able to close some of those gaps, whether it's optimization, security, DevOps, CI, CD, as we get more of those partners like I just talked about on the floor, then you see more and more enterprises being more open to leaning into Kubernetes a little yeah. bit. So. Yeah, we've seen, we've had some great conversations the last day and, and today as well with organizations that are History of companies like Ford Motor Company, yeah, for example, yeah, right which is right us. behind us yeah. with their, one yeah. of their EVs, yeah. and and it's they, they're becoming technology companies that happen to do yeah. cars or Home fintechs. Depot's here. That I love the Home yeah. Depot. Yeah. 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 I had a nice chat with them this morning. I'm yes. obsessed with that storyline. Honestly, yes. that yeah. we, we now have such a different lens into these organizations how yeah. they're using technologies, advanced technologies, Kubernetes, et cetera, to really become data companies because yeah. they have to be. Well, the consumers on the other end expect a Home Depot or a Ford or whomever, or your bank, yeah. to know who you are, I want the information yep. right here whenever I need it so I can do the transaction I need, and I yeah. want you to also deliver me information that is relevant to me, Yeah. because there, there's no patience anymore. Yeah, <laughs> and we partner with a lot of big FinTech companies, and it's, it's very much that. It's like, how do we continue to optimize, but then as they look at transitioning off of older organizations and capabilities, whether that's they have a physical data center that's racked to the gills and they can't do anything about that, so they want to move to cloud, or um, they're just dipping their toe into even private cloud with Kubernetes in their own instances, um, a lot of it is how do we do this, yeah. right? Like how do we lean in and yeah. yeah. Yeah, well I think you said it really well that it, the debate seems to be over in terms of do we go yeah. in on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. that, that was a theme that I think we felt that yesterday, Definitely. even on, on day one yeah. of the keynotes. Mm -hmm. The community seems to be uh, just craving more. I think that was another thing that we felt yesterday was all of the contributors and the collaborators, people want to be able to help drive this community forward because it, it's a flywheel mm -hmm. of symbiosis mm -hmm. for all of the vendors here, the maintainers, um, and, and really businesses in any industry can benefit. Yeah, it's super validating. I mean, if you just look at the floor, there's like 20 different booths that talk about cost reporting for Kubernetes. So not only uh, have people moved, but now they're dealing with those challenges at scale. And I think for us, it's very validating because there's so many vendors that are looking into the reporting of this and showing you the problem that you have and then where we can help is, okay, now you know you have a problem, here's how we can fix it for you. Yeah, yeah that, that sort of dealing with challenges at scale that you said, I think that's also what we're hearing yeah. and seeing Definitely. and feeling on the show floor. Yeah, no, absolutely. What can folks see and, and touch and feel in your booth? Uh, we have some demos there, you can play around with the product. Uh, we're giving away a Lego set, so we've let Gotta get Legos that. Legos are a hot thing right now. We're yep. gonna have to get some Lego. We do a swag segment at the end yep. of the day, every day now. We have some I've... cool socks. So. Yep. Socks are hot. Let's let's actually talk about scale internally as our closing question. What's going on at Stormforge? If someone's watching right now, they're excited. Yeah, are you hiring? we are hiring. Let's, yeah, how yeah. can they stock you? What's the Absolutely. scoop? Absolutely, <laughs> so you can check us out on stormforge.io. We're certainly hiring across the engineering organization. We're hiring across the UX, a product organization. Um, we're dealing, like I said, we've got some really big customers that we're, we're working through with some really fun challenges and we're looking to continue to build on what we do and do new innovative things. 
Like, especially because, like I said, we are a machine learning organization first. And so for me, it's like, how do I collect all the data that I can? And then let's find out what's interesting in there that we can help people with, whether that's CPU memory, custom metrics, like Yasmin said, um, preventing um kills, driving availability, reliability. What can we do to, to kind of make a little bit more transparent the stuff that's going on underneath the covers in Kubernetes for the decision makers in these organizations? Yes, transparency is a goal of many. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and you mentioned fun. If this conversation is any representation, it would be very fun to be working on both of we, your teams. We have a lot of fun. Yeah, Yasmin, Patrick, thank you so much for thanks joining for having us. us. Thank Lisa, you for as usual, thanks for being here with me. My pleasure. And thank you to all of you for tuning in to theCUBE's live show from Detroit. My name's Savannah Peterson, and we'll be back in a few.